in the back of Vail, Colorado here. It's been a few years, it's been three or four years since last time I was here, so we're going to be back. It's a bit late, so just a few considerations. But today is the feast of St. Gregory the Seventh. Uh, when you think of a warrior priest, priest who had nothing but adversities and battles all of his life, a uh, warrior pope, he is the most warrior of all the popes and uh, of, of the church in the last 2,000 years. St. Gregory the Seventh. He became the Pope in 1073, and when he became Pope, there was a great battle in the church, and that the, the and that he had several issues to deal with. One of them was the fact that the, because the church was the center of life, that the kings and the magistrates and anyone who has any civil authority would always try to control the priests and control the bishops, control the church, and the heresy of lay investiture. In fact, we could put this. This problem of the laity controlling the church, so the church was under other bounds. The bishop and the priest had to obey whoever the local lord was, and had to make rules and regulations based on the local lord. And then the priests themselves were absolutely morally corrupt. They were absolutely horrible. They were they were immoral in every way. And then they had to become completely corrupt. And that uh, so that immorality filled the entire clergy. There was homosexuality. There was uh, a lot of uh, living with uh, with women, and there was all kinds of simony and theft and wickedness because of the fact that since the good priests were never allowed to become bishops, the good priests is just like in our times we have we talk about a homosexual network in the church, which has been around for the last fifty years, and that at that time there was a simoniacal ne uh, 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 network in the church. So that the, 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 the duke or the lord or the king would invest a wicked priest who would do whatever he wanted to become the bishop. Then the bishop would make sure that any good young men in the seminary would not be ordained priests. And that if there was good men that got ordained priests, they were thrown in the very far-flung corners of the diocese. And that the bishop would obey the local magistrate, the local king, rather than obeying Rome. And then, there, and then moral corruption ensued, and it fostered priest hunting, uh, priests involved in business, priests involved in all matter of immorality, uh, bishops absolutely wicked. Any bishop that managed to be somehow good would barely make himself into the episcopacy and would be set aside by the other bishops. And the popes were kind of powerless until Hildebrand came. And Hildebrand was, he was, he was called Hildebrand from Germany, and he, he entered the monastery of Cluny, and he realized that we are going to have to we have to straighten out the church. And he recognized a formula, a formula which is uh, which is a formula that was Archbishop of the Feb imp implemented in the 20th century, and a formula that Saint Bernard of Clairvaux implemented shortly after the death of Saint Gregory the Seventh. And that is, in order to reform the church, we have to have independence of the priests. Out from the laity and, and from outside influence. There has been independence, and so that the local bishop has become under the authority of the king. We're supposed to normally be under the bishop, and normally we obey the bishop, but the bishop is simoniacal, the bishop is corrupt, and the bishop is filled with all manner of sin, and the bishop also is promoting whatever the local heresy is promoted in that region. And all kinds of heresies spread throughout the church. Every kind of heresy, the Albigensian heresy would come, the, the, and all kinds of heresies would come, which would promote every kind of sin. In fact, the heresies of that age are very similar to our age, in that the, the, the purpose of the church is to come up with a theological formula, which is supposed to tell you whatever immoral life you're living is okay. That's the duty of the church. So if you're living in sin, the, the Padre is supposed to give you the theological explanation of why living in sin is a good thing. And they were they're very much a very corrupt age in the church. And they're so much so that is the reason why people at that time believed that the world was coming to an end. That there was so much wickedness that certainly the church could not continue. And rose up Hildebrand, St. Gregory the Seventh. And that, you know, and that when he was a child, before he could read, as a little bitty baby, he didn't know how to read. And a carpenter had some wood that was laying on the ground. And he laid the wood, one of the books, one of the verses of the Psalms, and he says, And Christ shall rule from sea to sea. And they said, This child doesn't know how to read, 
But yet he, he wanted, he realized even as a little child that the only solution to crises in the church, crises in politics, crises of every kind, Christ must rule from sea to sea. And then, it was, then he eventually became a priest. He, he wanted to be a, simply a monk in a monastery. He was in the great monastery of Cluny. But they realized this man must go out to other places. And he was sent to Rome. And he became an abbot of a monastery in Rome. And then finally he was made a cardinal. And as a cardinal, he went around reforming the church, smashing priests and bishops that were wicked, and smashing them, and handing some of them over to the arm of the state where they would be put to death. Many priests today need to be put to death. And part of the solution of the crisis of the church today is that some of the most wicked bishops and most wicked priests, it is not sufficient that they be defrocked. They should be put to death. And they should be handed over to the arm of the, of the state and put to death. Others should be imprisoned for the rest of their lives. Others should be simply defrocked. And others should be demoted and smashed, still remaining allowed to be clergy. But one of the things we must recognize, as St. Hildebrand did, there were many saints, there were many men at the time that realized we must live according to the gospel. We must follow the truth, we must preach the truth. But St. Gregory the Seventh recognized you must put real soldiers in the army of Christ. There have to be real soldiers. And so he took them out of the monasteries. And he said, you know, the, the bishops will be chosen by their fellow bishops electing them. They will be chosen by Rome. No bishop will be allowed to become the bishop of diocese who has not been ratified by Rome. And then these bishops that are, that are made corrupt bishops that are made bishops, they're going to be defrocked. They're going to be smashed. And St. Gregory VII smashed them. And he, he smashed them completely, and he brought back fervor to the Catholic Church, and he brought back the doctrine to the Catholic Church, and he fought against the emperor, and he was fearless. Emperor Henry II was so wicked, he, he, he thought that he had such power over the church, and the church had lost its power so greatly, that St. Gregory VII was the first pope in history that stood up, and he said to all the people of Germany, the Holy Roman Empire, Germany, France, and Austria, and Northern Italy, he said, I, I tell all the faithful and every person in Germany and every person in the empire, Henry II, do not obey him. He has turned against God. He is promoting heresy. He is promoting all manner of evil. And therefore, I tell him, he may still be emperor, but he has no more power. And I command all of you to disobey him, including the cook. If he says, make him pizza, don't make him pizza. Is that so? He can be totally commanded the people that they should not obey him. And because the world was still Catholic, they obeyed Gregory the Seventh. And Henry the Second had to go down in, 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 into Manresa in the wintertime, where the Pope was. He had to leave Rome. And he had to stand in the snow three days barefoot outside of the castle of Manresa. But St. Gregory the Seventh looked out the castle and said, I don't believe you're sorry. And he made him stand three days barefoot in the snow. Finally, on the third day, he said, all right, I believe you have repented. Therefore, I will allow the people to continue to obey you. You may go back and be emperor. And he was a good emperor for about one year. And then he went back to being the wicked man that he always was. And then he went after St. Gregory and made him die in exile. But St. Gregory, however, he, even though he went back to wickedness and he died a wicked man, he was so terrified of St. Gregory that he had to control his wickedness. And here we must understand, when you're fighting as wicked men, you cannot kill every wicked man. You cannot execute every wicked leader. But they can be, they can, many of them, even if they can't be executed, even if they can't be eliminated, they can be controlled. They can be limited in their power. And then and the, 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 the wicked emperors and the wicked kings, they all recognize they could be wicked, but they better be careful because there's a pope now watching over them and they have to control themselves. And so they began to relinquish out of fear their control of the church. And St. Gregory VII was the warrior that built Christendom. He was the warrior that said Christendom, the foundation of Christendom was laid by St. Benedict. And in its perfection in the 1200s, the church had great glory and great peace throughout the world. But in the midst of its corruption in the 1000s, St. Gregory VII Hildebrand, his name the Firebrand, he was a firebrand who stood up and fought. And he held the church, and we need now another Hildebrand in our times. We need another St. Gregory VII. In his final words before he died was, 
He died outside the city of Rome because Henry was persecuting him and trying to get even for having to stand in the snow for three, barefoot, three, but he had, but barefoot for three days, and, and he was afraid of him. And he said in his final days, I have loved good, and I have hated iniquity, and therefore I die in exile. And so he did die in exile. But, the, but, the, but the, the, he emboldened the weak clergy. Weak bishops stood up and said, you know what, St. Hildebrand is behind me, St. Gregory is behind me. Some weak bishops were able to stand up against their simoniacal and controlling lords and dukes. And saints began to rise up. And there was a recognition, he says, there must be independent monasteries, such as Cluny, the greatest of them all, which had become corrupt after the death of St. Gregory VII. But he said, and, and then St. Bernard of Clairvaux, when the St. Bernard of Clairvaux, they formed an independent monastery in, in northern France, and then preached were saved. We cannot be under the rule of the laity. We cannot be under the rule of the, of the, of the arm of the laity. When well, St. Leo Pope Leo XIII recognized this as one of the problems of today. Here's an example of lay investiture, the stupid, demonic, idiotic coronavirus garbage. This non-coronavirus does not a virus, just a normal cold. What we have, however, with this normal cold is absolutely wicked laws. And some of the wicked laws are saying, you priests of the church, we're going to allow you to have a mass, but you can't give Holy Community communion around. They don't tell the McDonald's lady, that she, had, that she has to go outside and issue hamburgers to everybody outside. You can drive through the drive through window, and each person goes through the drive through window and get hamburgers, but you can't go out to the Holy Communion uh, table. You can't go up to the communion rail and receive Holy Communion. And you've got to wear a face mask at the church, and you have to make sure there's the distance between everyone. But when you go to Home Depot, you don't worry about it. When you go to Lowe's, you don't worry about it. When you go to Walmart, you don't worry about it. But in all the small places, they're closed. And the churches, they have rules and regulations. The, the state is going to decide how you go to church. And the state is going to decide how you go to Holy Communion. And this is the control of the state over the church, which is most wicked. And Pope Leo XIII recognized this was happening. Saint, and, and he said, therefore, in his prayer, St. Michael, which we say after the low mass, St. Michael, that had to defend this battle, we pray for the freedom and exaltation of Holy Mother Church. Freedom means that the church is no longer tied by the state. That there was the freedom of the church, and we are not tied by the state. We, even though we're hundred percent opposed to the, the noble sordo and all these noble sordo bishops who are, who are uh, unfortunately saying the new mass and practicing the Vatican II garbage. However, they should have a reason to recognize that we are not going to allow our churches to be shut down by this stupid government. We're not going to allow the churches to be shut down throughout the entire world. We're going to take our Catholics and we're going to march in the streets. Where is Bishop Dagger John Hughes? He was the spiritual son of Gregory VII. Bishop Dagger John Hughes in New York City back in the 1840s. What did he do? The Know Nothing riots happened throughout the entirety of the United States in the East, especially in Louisville, Kentucky, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and other places, killing Catholics. And whenever they, the uh, killing Catholics and burning down churches, and whenever they killed the Catholics and burned down the churches, what happened? That the, uh, the, the, the Catholics would say, I saw this, this, sheriff, this police officer, I saw that magistrate, I saw this person burning down the church. I saw this man kill my priest. And they would respond, I know nothing. And whenever those two words were said, all cases were dropped. There wasn't one speeding ticket. There wasn't one fine. There wasn't one arrest. There wasn't one punishment of any person involved in the Know Nothing riots. And they began to be called the Know Nothings because when you hear those two words, that's it. All cases were dropped. So they said, there's nothing you can do about the Know Nothings. And all the bishops agreed, except Bishop Dagger John Hughes of New York City. He decided to visit the mayor of New York City, but there's a majority of Catholics somewhere in America, in that city, in that diocese. He said, Mayor, I've come to see you. And he spoke in the spirit of St. Gregory Seventh, the feast today, King Hildebrand. Mayor, I've come to see you. And he says, you know, you know, Bishop, I know nothing. And Bishop Dagger John Hughes said, I know, Mayor, that you know nothing. I'm not here to ask you about what you know. I'm going to tell you what I know. And what I know is if one rock goes to one stained glass window in any one of our churches in New York City, if one of my Irish Catholics or any of our Catholics are touched, 
If there is any harm to any of our Catholic furniture, I'm taking all the Irish Catholics and every Catholic of New York City, and we're going to burn New York City to the ground. Just thought you might want to know. Goodbye, Mayor. And he walked out. And the mayor knew that Bishop Dagger John Hughes was going to do it. Now, while they were murdering Catholics in Louisville, Kentucky, murdering Catholics in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, burning down churches in other places, not one rock traveled through a single stained glass window in New York City, and not one Catholic was harmed there. Because Bishop Hughes defended his flock. Now, in this situation here, there are people dying because of this virus. There are people dying because, not because of the virus, which doesn't exist, but because they can't go to the hospital. And the priests are being held back from visiting and bringing them Holy Communion and anointing. Where is the bishop? The bishop should put on his, his, his chasual, put on his mitre, as St. Hildebrand did, and walk into the middle of the, of the hospital and say with all his Catholic priests, we are going into this hospital, we are going to anoint the dying, we are going to take care of the sick, we are going to have a procession, and there will be no one further than six feet away from anybody else. Everyone had better be closer than six feet, because this is a procession. And then what would they do? They would bow down in fear before the Catholic bishop. But the Catholic bishops are wimps. They are not doing what they should be doing. We have to praise the Lord of the harvest, that he sent laborers into the harvest, and we need another Hildebrand, another St. Gregory the Seventh for our times. We need another one like him. He saved the church. He died in battle, but he saved the church. And that it is necessary to have warriors that are ready to go and save souls. Warriors ready to go and fight against the wickedness going on in our world today. And St. Gregory VII is one of the great popes in history. Not as famous as St. Gregory the Great or St. Pius X. St. Pius X did the same thing, by the way. One story of St. Pius X. France said, we're going to take over, we're going to take over all your churches if you don't bow down to our wishes. We're going to possess all your churches, they said in 1905. You must bow down to our wishes. And St. Pius then sent back a little note. Go ahead, take the churches. We don't bow down to your wishes. You take our churches, we'll say mass in the streets. You take our priests and throw them in prison, we'll ordain new ones and send them in. We don't bow down to your wishes. And he defeated France in one short note. They did legally take over the churches, which they still own to this day. But then they didn't know what to do. How are we going to take care of the churches? And so they allowed the priest to continue to say Mass there, and the priest continued to say Mass. It ended up being an indirect blessing, because when Vatican II came, what happened? The bishops wanted to destroy the churches. But the Masonic government owns the churches, and many Masonic mayors said, you can't destroy this church because it's owned by the government. And you can't Vatican II wise this church because it's a historical register. And St. Pius X didn't know he was saving the churches. He was saving the faith. He knew that. He didn't know he was saving the buildings also. And so many years later, when they, when they, when they tried, to, tried to destroy the churches in the Vatican II, those churches were saved because... They were stolen by the government. The Masons saved the church, and the Catholic bishops were not able to destroy it because the Catholic popes said, I stand for Christ, and I'm ready to die for Christ, and I don't compromise Christ to, uh, uh, on behalf of, of, of for any of these governments or any of these individuals. So we must pray for these kinds of priests in our holy church and pray that some bishops be given back to our church because the harvest indeed is great. Many souls want Christ. But they don't know where to find him. The laborers are few. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that there be harvest or laborers who are ready to fight and gain the souls that Christ wants to be gained and the Blessed Virgin wants to be gained in this great fight that's going to come upon us in the soon victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary. God bless you all. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.